uh, work with us through the hands-on part of the apprentice journeyman or master beekeeping course. I'll talk more about that later. Then we place them. Uh, some, some we found wish to go back to college for studies and they do. Behavioral health care is integrated in the entire process and research uh, on visible and invisible wounds. My daughter uh, is a researchist also and with Kansas State University and the VA has some great plans to, uh, to document uh, all of what we found on an anecdotal basis so that it becomes a peer reviewed uh, evidence-based and on the shelf for people to use and agricultural. Uh, the seed companies and, and others are using us as a test base and the value there is that almost everything we get is free from them. And so again, a model for all land grant universities. Next slide, please. So, so uh, uh, we had uh, uh, one year 20 and another year 15 Kansas State University graduate students in agriculture help us design this farm. Uh, they just loved doing it. It was a keystone project for them over two years. So we have 308 acres now about 12 miles from where I'm sitting as our training farm. And we have this, um, this um, shop also to, for the woodworking and welding portions. And then we have bees out in about 29 different locations, just came back from California two days ago. <laughs> um, next slide, please. And so uh, this is a, a drone view that's a little old. Um, this was uh, when we were leasing the farm initially, we now have it. It now belongs to us, purchased by the Nature Conservancy. And there are 90 acres of, uh, of this year it's in wheat, but we've had it in corn, soybeans, and milo. And then we have uh, 25 acres of, uh, of alfalfa that we let bloom for the bees. And we have um, had as many as 98 head of cattle on our, our, two, on our 13 different um, um, paddocks on pasture out there. And, um, and then we have a specialty crop. We're putting up greenhouses and we have a full, full up garden. We have 480 trees in an orchard, fruit orchard and nut orchard. And so, and so it's developing. So this older picture, if I were to take it today, would look somewhat different. We've cleared a, a dry lot for the cattle. We put up a barn that's in much better shape. You see up on the top bar there, our first summer calf was born two years ago. The very first calf we had is in the squeeze chute. A picture of uh, the, the person running the combine and loading into the truck is a staff sergeant that now farms down in, uh, in Georgia. So next slide, please. <clears throat> And this is what we will have on the farm eventually, uh, a little bit bigger than this, but this will house all the offices, the therapy rooms, um, the classrooms, um, some, some uh, residences for, for our students there. Um, and we're, we're on the way to finding the money to do that. Um, and I think the, uh, we just had a grant for the first barn and shed to go up, come through this week. And our hope that we will, will be looking much like this in the future. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so we have an 11 month certificate in farm managed and allied skills. Um, our first class was in January of, of 2019. Um, we are now qualified for the GI Bill and the Volk Rehab Program and the Tuition Assistance Program. And we have scholarships also. And so the full range, uh, very heavy farm economics our instructors are all farmers, very successful farmers uh, with uh, uh, PhDs or a higher level degree in addition to their farming experience. In addition to that, uh, seed companies and uh, stock companies and specialty crop folks come in uh, and, and give us special classes on, on various items. And the crew down on the right hand is behind the building that we're sitting in right now. In addition to uh, bee, beehives, we at one time built goat sheds, but uh, we've done away with that. A uh, little, little too uh, much of a project for this warehouse, and we've had them stick with beehives because the the, the demand is so great, we can't keep up with the uh, with the orders. Next slide, please. Um, we also do internships. So, uh, yeah, two young sergeants on the top uh, were on a cattle farm for a year. Um, the one on the left stayed to take the farm over, worked out a transfer deal with the owner. He'll stay. The other is now farming in Missouri, a cattle farm. 
And, and they are able then, once they know the, exactly what they want to do, go out and work on a farm with, uh, with a farmer. Um, and we try to place them on a farm that's in the last generation. We pay a stipend to the intern and the farmer. And, uh, <clears throat> and we also give them credit for that. Next slide, please. Farm and agribusiness tours. We've had over a thousand now. That says 450 there. I guess I need to upgrade that. We've had a over a thousand accompany us on farm tours this last year because of COVID, we couldn't do it. That they visit 50 farms and 14 different agribusiness entities are either visited or they come to the farm and brief. And uh, it's a great program. Um, and we've gotten so many folks uh, on this in this orientation program that stay with us in the in the in the uh, in the course. Next slide, please. And last but not least, beekeeping, apprentice to commercial. Uh, we're pretty light on the commercial at this point, but we do migrate our bees to California. We've done that for a couple of years, and they're we're told by um, the bees and, and and all the beekeepers out there, the large beekeepers, that they need help. Uh, with qualified beekeepers and particularly those that can manage. Um, and again, we've had uh, over a thousand now soldiers and veterans that have gotten at least an introductory course in beekeeping. Um, we've had um, a little over 500 now that um, have enrolled in our programs. And I think we are up to about 210 that have taken uh, Jerry's courses at uh, the University of Montana. Um, and then for each course that they take, and we have paid their tuition for, uh, they do the hands-on time with us. And that's 40 hours in this shop and 80 hours out hands-on with us at the beehives. Um, and so we are just adding the first commercial course. We've got a couple students now, and we hope to work this summer with Jerry and building it, the first curriculum for a full up commercial, commercial course to be the first in the US. We also have this full range beekeeping supply business. We produce honey and uh, sell it, uh, all we make. Um, um, uh, we've tried to get bigger. We have a partnership with the packer locally. We can do 25,000 bottles a day. And so we're going to start, um, start uh, working with some big folks. Our first customer is Bashes in, in Arizona, but Kroger's is going to work with us. And so we're going to teach packing as well as all other forms of commercial beekeeping. Um, you can see in that, we also do, you can see one of our classes down on the lower right-hand side, we have bee boot camps once a month. Uh, that's open for everybody. And we also rearrange our shop where we're sitting right in the middle of that now, uh, so that we can give classes to our own students. Um, and we also have that little, little um, label right up in the upper right middle, homegrown by heroes. If 50% of the process involves a veteran, uh, then the, the product that's made, whether it's honey or whether it's woodenware, can have that label on it. And our honey is all um, guaranteed by Genu Honey. It's a fairly new certification process. Um, and so next slide, please. Um, and this is a, a, for, a typical class. I have to tell you that the Army requires us to have everybody fully suited up in a full suit. <laughs> you have to wear gloves, you have to, and that's just uh, their, their requirement. Um, you can see me sitting off to the right there. I violated that a little bit, but we're just installing, learning how to install some packages there. And it's a fairly typical class. We just went through a bunch of that with the truckload of packages that came in, um, I guess a week before, two weeks ago, three weeks ago. Next slide, please. And these are just some of the folks. Uh, so I, the, the guy on the left-hand side all the way is uh, now farming in uh, Minnesota. He has 50 beehives of his own. Mark Gifford, a Lieutenant Colonel, standing next to me on the left, is farming here in Kansas. He has a small uh, farm. He only has 10 colonies, but he sells that honey as a supplement to, to uh, his other income. The Staff Sergeant to the right of me, Jeff, uh, uh, Efford lives over in Junction City and has two hives in his backyard. And the gentleman on the right is, uh, and these are typical of the students we have, is a retired um, sergeant. He now lives in Kentucky and farms a uh, half section of tobacco, alfalfa. And he is up to 75 hives on his property now. 
and hopes to grow even further. And so those are kind of the results we get of the training program and it's amazing. So they've all been through you know, Jerry's courses. They've all uh, served their time with us and they're out being successful in farming. Next slide and beekeeping. This is a, that, that course again, we have a bee boot camp and we stage these so that we present uh, where those folks should be in the beekeeping process each month. We give them a primer, a bit of bee biology every time we get together, but then we, we, we focus on where they should be. And we also do uh, in the wintertime soap making and wax uh, processing classes and, and, uh, and uh, they, they just fill up. I mean, they just fill up. The demand for this sort of thing out there is so great right now, it's just incredible. Next slide, please. And this is in our warehouse and packages that we had come in. This isn't this year, this was a few years ago, but we also sell in addition to honey and, and some of the inventory you can see on the shelves there. If you need it for beekeeping, we really have it here. And uh, we sell bees in packages and nukes and 10 frames, um, 10 frames. We just had some trucks come back from, uh, from um, California. Uh, two days ago, they're all out putting those beehives back in their location, and and we sell everything we can package, everything we can <laughs> we can uh, we can split and bring back. It's sold before we get we we get it here. Next slide, please. And so that was our very first load, California, a small load of 342 colonies a couple of years ago. We have a a great uh, trucking firm that works with us and gets them out there and back at very low cost. And our, our, um, we, we're gonna stop at about 500 colonies, maintain about 500 colonies, that's, that's enough to train. It takes a lot of time to train beekeepers. So um, it takes much more time to uh, keep the bees flowing. Next slide, please. We have a lot of partners here. I won't go through them all, but the Nature Conservancy and uh, the Departments of Agriculture, Veterans Affairs, um, uh, and um, also with the University of Montana, and all those other organizations you see there, we just have a, a great crew that are helping us through this. Next slide, please. So this is a young man, I'll, I'll just share your story. You saw him in the slides, he's a master beekeeper now, cutting some, um, I think, entrance reducers in the slide there. He's a staff sergeant, had seven tours of duty in Iraq and Afghanistan, severe post-traumatic stress. And when he came to us and he's approved our use of this, he was on suicide watch, so we had to watch him all the time. Um, 16 pills a day, he was kind of in a fog. He began working with me in March of 2014. Um, and within three months, down to six pills. Much more confident, he was off the watch, and he became an apprentice beekeeper. In six months, no pills, express happiness and joy for the first time in a long while. He was a journeyman beekeeper, and within a little over a year, we hire him as our assistant farm manager, and he's a master beekeeper and his family is together and doing well. And so that's, that's, a, that's a typical story of hundreds of folks that we've had to come through the program. And it's just absolutely a, a warm, a wonderful thing to see these young, young men and women recover. We've had about 5% uh, women in the course, um, not as many as we'd like to see, but uh, just a tremendous success. Next slide, please, getting toward the end here. So this is my daughter. And my uh, and her husband, beekeepers in my backyard. <laughs> well, I had a few hives there with a pretty nice frame of honey, and uh, she is the one that's going to uh, um, follow on this presentation. We're at the half hour mark just now, and so um, I guess it's time to stop and see what questions we may have. And so I'm here to answer any questions you might have. That's our, our logos again, and uh, our contact information, if you wish to capture that. Um, surely, if you have follow-on questions, feel free to, to reach out to me at that number. My cell is better, or my email address, and uh, more than glad to take any questions you might have over time. Okay, Gary, thank you very much. Um, we'll, we'll turn this, the program over to Ray Olivares. Ray is with Olivares Honeybees. Um, for those of you who have been attending these WAS monthly mini conferences, he, is, he and his company have sponsored the last three, including this one. But, uh, and 
after the question and answer, there'll be a short video on Bob Ray, his family, and, and their beekeeping operation. But uh, so it's my pleasure to introduce not only one, cool, a person I think is one of the best representatives of the commercial beekeeping world who produces queens and packages and, and runs tens of thousands of colonies and produces honey and has free operation locations in Montana and his queen breeding operations in California and Hawaii. Uh, Ray Oliveris, uh, I also think, uh, I dare say that I, I call him a friend. So Ray, would you like to take over and ask some questions of Gary? Um, are we on? Okay, I didn't know if we were sorry, muted. <laughs> so Jerry, um, in your training, so, you know, I was sitting here with Frank and, and I got to say something real quick, Jerry, about what you were talking about, about our company. And, you know, you're, you're only as good as the people that you work with. <laughs> so there's a lot of credit that goes to everybody that's involved. Okay. And it's the same, probably success for you, Jerry, um, with the program that you're running. It's, it takes more than, than just one person, you know? So, um, why you were talking about the training and th the things that you're doing and, and, you know, kind of hinting towards the commercial side, uh, Frank and I, we, of course we were muted. We were like, wow, um, this is a tough one. Um, I mean, you know, I'm, 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 I'm not at a loss for questions, but, um, you know, we have a lot of, um, there's a lot of, difficulties in the bee industry on a commercial level and our number one problem is really frank do you, would you agree i don't it's it's finding people to work in the bees right yeah the climate the you know getting stung there's some some hurdles to cross the first couple of weeks but it's quite enjoyable once you get past those nuances and start to really it's almost meditative you know get out of the office get out in the field the weather the climate the the surroundings and it's it's i enjoy it when i'm out in the field yeah so you know we find in the commercial it's it's it, it, the beekeeping's on a commercial level is very demanding and it's physical and so but they're you know we're even exploring how many hives do we want to manage ourselves as a company because it, it's um the um the variables now in keeping the honeybees alive are off the charts right. with the viruses, you know, the mites and the viruses, and then our, our climate, um, you know, just keeping the bees healthy and having enough forage for the bees. So training people to understand the variables and, and cause and effect. As a beekeeper, you have to think, we're constantly, I'm constantly thinking, if this is happening right now, what's six months going to look like? You have to you you have to think out almost a year in advance, constantly to be successful, a real successful. And if you don't, you're not prepared for those changes that that occur next week or two months later. Um, so I I think on the level of uh, training, what would be actually I'm just forming a question right now in my mind um, when I think about what's missing in the skills it's the understanding of cause and effect of the lack of nutrition the, the pollens the nectars the weather um, you know it's this the skills here not so much here absolutely does that make sense it, sure that's why that's why the uh, course we put together includes migration and managing 300 beehives per person, that sort of thing. And they understand by the time they're through that, that it's, it's to begin with, it's hard work. These guys are, are uh, mature. They're, um, by the time they get to the point that they want to get into commercial beekeeping, they know that they want to get there. They've been stung. They've had their Botox treatments every day for many days. They, uh, they, and they understand how difficult it is to maintain bee colonies today. The first time I kept them was in 1955, and it was not so much a problem then. It's so different today, but they do understand that, and and um, and all of those factors are integrated into the course, 
And so a lot of our course is hands-on. You, you have to do it, understand it, uh, go with them to California, and you come back, get them out to produce honey, uh, treat them and, and make sure that they live and thrive and understand you're going to lose a bunch. I mean, all that's part of the training. And the folks, it's, it's a, in this farm training program, we have far more people that want to come learning beekeeping than farming. Um, uh, a lot of them are hobbyists, but there's, a, there's an upper level tier that uh, these are folks that are mature. A lot of them are retired from the army. They come with a retirement, they come with medical care, and they're just just enthused about getting into the commercial side of the beekeeping. And so, and so uh, by the time they leave us and take a job somewhere else, um, they're, they're ready to go and they understand not only the hands-on portion, but also the market. It's hard to market honey today on a larger scale, uh, as you know. And so, and so we, we try to expose them to all of those things. We don't, we don't, it's not just a cosmetic course that we have it's one with their hands on and they're, they're uh, engaged deeply in the, in the program and understand all those variables pretty well. Yeah, you know, the one thing that I try to, I try to explain to people all the time, uh, you know, we have our hobby, we well, we haven't had our hobby day for the last couple of years. Jerry's been out here before. We, we, our yeah. first hobby day 10 years ago was 150 people and the last one was right around 3000 people. Um, maybe 1200 beekeepers, but a couple thousand people just interested in bees, fascinated. Okay. But when people want to, especially just learning about bees, they, they, you know, they don't want to make mistakes. Um, unfortunately, with beekeeping, it's unlike most other industries, uh, you, you have to make mistakes. I mean, you have to make mistakes to learn, <laughs> but with bees, it's um, it's really an unfair advantage, a disadvantage, <laughs> when you've only got about five years in beekeeping to compared to somebody that's made mistakes for thirty years. <laughs> it's it's um, just being you have to be aware, and that's what's so I think uh, appealing about bees and taking care of bees because you you got a live animal, sure. and it's an adrenaline rush in the springtime when things are growing and and you're successful at, at you know, dividing hives or, or manipulating and make, you know, making two out of one or three out of one. And so, and then it's also when there's no forage and you're in a drought and you have 2 million acres of fires <laughs> in California, it, it can be, it's, it's pretty hard on you mentally also. And so um, it's very rewarding when you're successful. And so, you know, we, we're always telling people uh, if they want to do a hundred, try 10 first, try five and be successful and, and then grow from there, you know. We, we uh, our bees were not far from you. Henry Harlan, Bullfrog Bees, you probably know him. Oh, uh, down in Winters. Yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. Winters. Well, he's the, he's, he helps us out there, part of our team. Okay. And, yeah, so he lost... Uh, he had 9,000 colonies, lost half of them to fires last year. Our students were right there with him. They were part yeah. of that. So, so, and as a result of those fires, we couldn't spend as much time as we should have on our colonies. And, and we yeah. lost some as a result. So they know, they see it firsthand. They still love it. Yeah. <laughs> good no, that, that, that's generally, if people, if you're in bees, you have a passion for bees, but it's, it, it's, it, it, it really is a, noble profession yes so okay do you want uh, um gary i've been kind of watching both the chats and the question and answers uh, uh there was a question about whether the slides be available uh all of the programs that uh, uh we do um and, and chris do, are you i assume you're recording this Yeah, we're recording it. <laughs> yeah, so we record all the sessions, and then, uh, you know, I look at my own thing. Gee, I don't know if it turned on. <laughs> uh, anyway, we record the sessions and then post them on a YouTube channel in a few days after the presentation, so that then people can come back at their leisure, or you know, like a night like the night, a balmy night, first day in spring, and so on. People, uh, 
getting outside and so on, I suspect. But, you know, so not everybody can meet the time zones or, or have the time at the, it, when it's given live. So we put them all on the YouTube channel. So, you know, everybody can catch up with those. Um, and then there's a... Um, there's some questions about do you screen your applicants and I think some of these questions Gary you can ask, answer offline and, and text but they're asking about how you got started or how you get through the bureaucratic red tape and so on. Sure. We, we just dove into it <laughs> and, uh, and I guess that's the best way to define it. It wasn't so difficult to get started because of the demand for farmers out there. I mean it was just Incredible that the USDA funded some of our, our uh, courses. We've had several nice grants from them. And, and the demand is so great for new farmers that, um, that it was not difficult to get started. Good support from Congress, um, uh, good support from donors, constant demand, constant calls from farmers asking for our, our students. So um, if, if Gary, you want to, I can get into that deeper with someone and, and give them a better, better response than that if they'd like to know how we got started and what to do if you'd like to do something that's similar. Jerry, I have a, I actually have a question, a question or a point to make. I, I'm not sure which one it is, but one of the biggest things that we wish we could find is people with trade skills, woodworking. Uh, some Landscaping. of these other things that you're doing, oh my God, they, they all, they, they need to be applied to the beekeeping part of it too. Daily, mm -hmm. we, we, enter, we have all these little issues and having somebody with that, those trade skills, whether it's woodworking, uh, electrical, uh, construction, things like that, uh, that's part of beekeeping too. No, we do, we do uh, all of our beekeeping students uh, at the, at the uh, master and commercial level come with a commercial driver's license, a welding certificate, a woodworking, OSHA woodworking certificate, um, a forklift, OSHA forklift certificate, and an OSHA 10 certificate also. Uh, and the metalworking, they also, if they don't have the mechanic skills, one of the local um, uh, trade schools will take them for a summer session and teach them basic mechanic skills. Most of these folks have them come out of the military. There's so many transfer, transferable skills that uh, we found that uh, not so hard to fulfill those requirements, but all of those allied trades are part of our program. Nice. Right. And on the B side, as well as, uh, as the farm side. And, and Ray, again, um, you, you and I and, um, and Gary, it's, and sometime when things slow down a little bit for all of us, it should be it should chat a little bit more because Gary and I have been talking with the University of Montana. We've got a, a full the Missoula College that has small you know, small engine repair, welding, uh, woodworking, carpentry, electrical, and so on. And one of the thoughts we've been at is that. You know, we kind of tag team each other back and forth. His students take our classes and then they get the mentorship down there. We want to take that to the next level in the next year or so. We're And one of the things we're trying to identify is exactly the question you asked is what kind of skills and so on might they want? And do we, you know, obviously Gary's going to have a limited capacity and he's, he's in the Midwest, but with a large number of commercial beekeepers, we have in Montana, for example, your free operations, great opportunities for internships and so on, but also uh, one of my own goals here is uh, is in the next coming year, be working with Gary on some of these next steps for commercial uh, beekeeping training and maybe programs along that line and seeing if we could also roll in the University of Montana's Missoula College because they offer all those trade type of things and have a second place, you know, Western location for some of that training and one down in Kansas, so we can start kind of diversifying, spreading this out. Um, Gary, uh, Frank, uh, Frank, I hope you you might agree with me. When I think about this now, just it, I don't know if you call that an epiphany. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I just realized how much we yearn for people that, that not just that. Wanting to work in bees is one thing. Yeah. But 
how to drive a vehicle, uh, cause and effect of all these other things. The lack of skills in, uh, I guess we'll call it trade skills, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like home ec, which yeah. they, we don't have at our high schools anymore. Uh, they bleed a company that you bleed to death uh, with mistakes and, and damaged stuff. And uh, it, it's, it's mine. It, it, you'd be surprised how much people want that because a lot of, you know, the, the work ethic, the bees will come with the work ethic wanting to be there and then a joy for the bees. But the re the other things uh, are what people are di uh, searching for, the other skill sets, to be honest. I mean, Frank? Yeah, no, it was agreed. I mean, when we get new employees and we go through, you know, everyone has an experience, but uh, driving a truck loaded with honey is very different than driving an empty truck. I mean, there's a lot of things that just get taken for granted <laughs> coming into the field that are, skills that are very necessary tying down the load checking the vehicle make sure the operating lights brakes all the things you're going to need you don't want to be going down the you know the freeway with pallets of honey and the brakes don't work right or you know all those things it, it it's a little bit beyond common sense but there's a very big common sense factor to a lot of it you know you can teach people just about anything but having them comprehend it and understanding it the work going into the first hive you touch to the hundredth hive you touch needs to be identical um there's you know if you're not helping that hive you you're you're hurting it well just just a couple of our students came back from california with a truckload of bees they got to winnemucca and the transmission went out <laughs> it, it, within about two hours they had they had relied on their veteran status and they found some folks and uh, that were able to get a truck out there load them up get them on their way within two hours and they're going to fly their guys back out here to pick their truck up again critical, so, critical so these are innovative skills. folks that, that you get i mean they're mature folks that come into our program to begin with and innovative and capable that's just incredible how well they do. On the allied skill side, all the farming communities, uh, all the stockyards, all the um, different forms of farming cannot find enough folks with CDLs. They need thousands of them. Yeah. So yeah. it's the same with welders, it's the same with all of them. We get, we get requests to turn out more CDL, CDLs and more welder, welding certificates. So there's just a vast need out there that we can't even begin to touch in our farm training program. But we prepare the folks that we, we put out uh, to be able to do those things. And, and, and a third opinion here, and, and normally I don't interact with, with, with these presentations, but I grew up in the farming industry and so on. I came off of a dairy, but it was dairy and beef cattle and custom cropping and, and so on. And I know when I talk to the beekeepers and I talk to people like Ray, and I also talk to some of their employees and over the years, they keep saying to me, you know, the 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 owners of the operation and so on say, gee, you know, we get these people in and if they come in and we get a good one, we train them up. And then about the time we get them trained, they go work for Joe Blow over here or they go set up their own, hang out their own single. On the other hand, I run into employees who say, I'd really like to do more than just, you know, catch queens or work the bees in there or work in the honey house and so on. I'd like to be able to, you know, to grow in this, but the way it is, we're so busy in the job we have and so on, and there's just no chance for me to learn these other skills and stuff. And what I see in a program like Gary's putting together and what Gary and I are thinking about in the coming year or two here is that I, I can apply this to my own experience because we had to hire folks for all those different lives, whether it's beef operation we had or the dairy or the custom cropping or the uh, baling and stacking, whatever it was. Uh, we went through a lot of busted up equipment and so on too, because we did, you, you get people in, they didn't have the skills, they didn't know how to handle them. Frank talking about uh, driving a truckload of, uh, uh, of beehives and so on. Yeah, I, <laughs> try stacking bales back when we had to do them manually and so on, and trucks coming through hilly areas and stuff. And I remember sitting and I was standing on one hillside watching my dad drive a truck down the hill across the levee and up the other side. 
The damn truck came down at such an angle you could see the ropes crossed on top of the load. You just uh, <laughs> crossing your fingers and hoping that that thing held in there. So, and I, I actually have followed beekeepers who've lost their damn loaders off the back of the truck. So, <laughs> so Ray, one of the things I see about this is that, you know, what you, Ray, or Randy Oliver, or somebody else might want in terms of day to day, how to handle the bees, the, the kind of the, the hands-on thing, you've all got your own ways and things you do and so on. And, you know, bees are tolerant. They put up whatever, whatever we do and so on. But, you know, I run into the folks who think the class that we had ought to be saying, well, pick up the frame, do this. And, so on. and we try to look at a bigger issue about why they're doing things. And it's more than just putting bees in a box. And I think Gary is doing the same thing with the training he's doing here. What I see is an opportunity to take some of that education and wear and tear and time out that you have, you know, could be better focused on your businesses if we could bring in people that are at least have a rudimentary training and skills or sometimes, you know, really specific skills to fit right into your operations. You don't have to do as much of that and maybe have a bigger pool of, um, of qualified employees to pick from. <laughs> One thing we can do, Ray, and that is, uh... We, we bounced our curriculum. We, we haven't fully finished this with the University of Montana yet. We have an interim curriculum. We bounced that off of uh, Kelvin, A.D. and Chris Hyatt and a few others. And we need to bounce it off a much wider group to include you so they can take a look at it and make sure that it's covering the things that you would want to have us. Some of our students find they go, they'll go work with Kelvin and the bees are, they manage their bees totally differently than, than, than uh, Chris does. So they understand that. Um, and we, we don't try to rigidly tell them this is the way it has to be done. Here, here is a way it is done and then show them some alternatives along the way. They're pretty, they're, they're pretty resilient people too. They understand that. Um, so well, well, Gary, we can bounce them off of you, right? Yeah, Gary, one thing that you'll, you'll find, and you, you know, I know you know this, but you can go 100 miles in either direction and beekeeping's a little different. Sure. Well, well. And, yep. you know, there's, there's some basic things that you, but it's things that you learn over time. Uh, you can read all you want until you practice it. Um, it's hard, you know, it, it, it just, it changes a lot, you know, and um, I saw there's a question here or a comment about adding, Frank, where did that go about the veterinarian? Oh. certificate high treatment requirements um anthony asked uh you may want to add a veterinarian tech certificate for high treatment requirements that's a good idea uh, we, yeah, we, that's we, actually we, some, something that's on my bucket list of things to get done and for the last couple of years i've been working on building a um a, a, a module on um uh, b in a sense of b pest and disease but also having uh, talked to a lot of veterinarian groups and so on where the veterinarians are now, because of the FDA change a couple of years ago, have licensed veterinarians prescribe antibiotics. But they were one horse show. They're basically there to prescribe an antibiotic for fowl brood. Uh, bees need veterinarians. Those veterinarians need to know something about bees. A lot of them have no knowledge about bees. And it doesn't, you can't, just because you're a veterinarian for a bit large, for a cattle operation, I disagree with one of our veterinarians in the state of Montana says, well, I can treat cattle, I can treat bees. Well, that's not necessarily so. Um, and, you know, I, it, I I have been collecting videos and so on to put together at least some type of an uh, online course for general beekeepers and for veterinarians and so on to know their way a little bit better around the diagnostics and how and treatment options and where you can make a visual call where it might require a, a laboratory and so on. So, so that's on, on the list. <laughs> well, we also had a class for all the vets here, well, all the vets in this region, we called them in, gave them a, gave them a class. And, um, and um, at least, at least there was probably 25 in the group uh, that came in and about half of them are keeping bees now and the other others are intending to keep bees. So I just had a call today from a vet over not so far away uh, asking questions. So I think I think if we reach out to them too, uh, we'd be smart to do that. Most of them have no idea. Yeah, yeah. Right after that FDA thing came down in Montana, I and uh, some folks went and talked to our veterinary medical board in the state so that they knew what was coming down. At that time, there was the big issue about uh, pharmaceuticals for commercial scale. 
And the upshot of that discussion was that uh, Western B became a licensed pharmacy for antibiotics. But uh, about six months later, I had the first training session for veterinarians in Montana. Now, remember, we're a large state with low population and veterinarians kind of sparsely distributed. It's not like we got a whole bunch of pet uh, care doctors in a big urban area. It's not like that. I was amazed. I had 75 people show up, uh, all licensed veterinarians, all wanting to understand this, these changes in the laws and know more about bees so they actually could go out and safely inspect the colony and, and have some idea what they're doing. I looked at what AFA was putting out and I shuddered because it just it, it forgot all about the fact that these guys don't know anything about working with bees and so on. So issues like bee safety and 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 what anything other than uh, this one trick pony, as I call it, of uh, are they sick of pob root? And so the fact that there are other pest diseases are just really not even being addressed. So there's a real need that I see here, and it's one of the you know. If I could clone myself, uh, I think Gary feels the same way, and so on. we can get more done. But uh, there's only only a few of us. Uh, but watch out, Ray. You're you're. I'm a little younger than Gary. He's just a little older than than uh, me. And your father's right there in the middle. And I, I think we need another. Maybe we can destroy his retirement too. <laughs> bring, bring him into the other group. The other group we found that needs help is FSA. All these county FSA offices that manage bee programs know very little about bees. So we brought them all in and uh, and taught them uh, a little bit more about it. And that's paid dividends for us, it's particularly the ELAP guys that are involved in ELAP. Now they understand bees a whole lot better than they used to, a little easier to work with and, and, uh, and, and get the checks in without all the work that we have to do otherwise. Okay, I'm watching the clock here. We are running a little long, but we're still fine. I figured an hour for each. Um, let's take a quick break here. Uh, uh, Chris will play uh, a video that'll, that'll help our watchers uh, learn a little bit more about our moderator, uh, Ray Oliveras and his, his helper here, Frank. Uh, and if you have to make a run for, for a quick break here, and that's a good time to do it too. And we'll be back right on the top of the hour with uh, Sherry to talk about the clinical aspects of this. Chris? You want to spool that up? Sure, right there. Chris, I'm getting the blue box in the it's middle of the screen. all about the bees here at Oliveris Honeybees. Our family has raised bees in Northern California for over 50 years, and we're passionate about... Uh, it's not playing. No, I'm getting a blue box in the right-hand corner. Something's on your one of your monitors sitting on top of the video. Yeah, there's like a pixelation on the right quadrant of the player. Oh, yeah, and it, there's a square sitting yeah, right there. Yeah, that's, uh, that's actually the Zoom panelist window. Let me get rid of that. <laughs> yeah. We'll go ahead and start that over. That there we better? go. Okay. It's all about the bees here at Oliveris Honeybees. Our family has raised bees in Northern California for over 50 years, and we're passionate about raising premium queens and package bees for commercial and backyard beekeepers, as well as producing pure and raw honey and providing pollination services. My dad has been keeping bees since 1965, and he learned from the pioneers of the trade, and he's passed that knowledge down to me. Now our children are the third generation of Oliveris beekeepers. At OHBs, we strive to manage our colonies in innovative ways, and we look for bees that thrive on a day-to-day -day basis. By adding desirable genetic traits, our bees are more tolerant to environmental changes. That's how we're helping sustain and replenish bees throughout the United States and Canada. We also select remote locations for our hives with abundant sources of nectar and pollen, fresh clean water, and protection from both pests and pesticides. From Northern California's sun-drenched valleys and temperate mountains to Montana's vast fields of yellow clover and Hawaii's big island with nearly 2,000 types of flowering plants, all of which help us supply premium queens year round. As fellow beekeepers, we know our customers rely on us for healthy, top quality queens and packaged bees. 
and we know that every customer's hives are living communities. So we're unwavering in our commitment to providing superior service, education, and on-time delivery. At Oliver's Honey Bees, we create a culture of bee lovers, so our entire staff is passionate about what's best for the bees. Around here, we do what we love and love what we do. Being kind, honest, and positive is who we are, and that translates to our customers, our employees, and of course, the bees. We believe that beekeeping is a noble profession, and at Oliver's Honey Bees, we are proud to be stewards of healthy bees. Healthy bees is what we stand for at OHB. Partnering with innovators like Albert Robertson is important to us as a company and the health of the bee industry. In the future, the Saskatraz Bee Breeding Project is going to establish natural selection apiaries in the Sacramento Valley to look at selection for varroa tolerance in one of the toughest environments to grow bees in, high mite pressure, marginal summer forage, and intensive agricultural practices. At Olivera's Honeybees, we are proud to lead the way in queen bee strength and education to sustain our industry. Thanks, Chris. Well, we're right on, uh, on the money here. It's my pleasure to, to introduce our second speaker who has a fairly close relationship with Gary since she's, <laughs> she's his daughter. Uh, and she's a clinical psychologist that's been working with these soldiers. And I personally am really, I, I've talked to Gary a, a lot about what he sees going on and so on uh, ever since he first took our courses and so on. But it's, it's my pleasure to have an opportunity to hear what Sherry has to say. So Sherry, it, the stage is yours. <laughs> okay, great. Well, welcome everybody. And I'm happy to have an audience to talk to you about the integration of beekeeping and, and behavioral health. And um, okay, so you can go to the next slide and start the video, please. So 20, 27 years altogether of service, and I've been two trips to Afghanistan and two trips to Iraq. You know, I didn't want to get out. I had 16 years in the military. To start with, it was PTSD. Some of the soldiers deal with post-traumatic stress disorder and TBI. Um, I was one of those cases. So I, I was very likely to be one number 23 instead of 22. So. The beginning it was really rocky, but now I'm a lot better. A safe farm is a response to uh, several national needs. Although the genesis uh, of the safe farm is my daughter, a clinical psychologist. Because I had a, a number of friends and a number of friends who married to someone who was in the military and also just a result of being a child of the military and becoming aware of the multiple deployment tours and the issues that are happening with our veterans and, and soldiers and families. So we had this idea to start a farm for soldiers and service members and veterans and it's called SAVE which means Service Member Agricultural Vocation Education. And so we just talked about it, talked about it. And since I was keeping bees, we, uh, we decided that we ought to try as a pilot, as a, as a niche, as a pilot beekeeper. And so um, about that time, I was contacted by the Warrior Transition Battalion and asked if I would teach a class in beekeeping. And that uh, changed into a rather formal training. And now, with today's session, um, although this is just basic today, we've actually train or are in the process of training 165 soldiers. That's seven bucks a pound. So that's about $21,000 for this program. We'll right back into the program. When Big Gary first told me about this, I said, well, you, you, you're taking these uh, soldiers who've been um, used to this kind of stress, now they're de-stressing, and you're taking them out there with the bees. And he said, you know, it's amazing that there's a There's a connection. They focus on the bees. They're not alarmed by the bees. 
and there's a calming effect that takes place. So all of this has to do with a purpose, a focus, and these kinds of uh, things that provide a, a way ahead for these young soldiers and service members. I think that as a group we can see that when the service members and veterans come together they have that camaraderie, that sense of brotherhood, working together. Um, we can actually parallel a lot of that with how the bees work together and how there's a lot of um, interaction and they're, everybody has their own job and they're doing something and you're working together cohesively as a unit so to say. Uh, just as you did as a soldier or as you will in life. So next week we need to come back and add another honey super under that and then I'll start making honey in that one. We had the beekeeping program going along pretty well and so we can train everything from basic beekeeping to light commercial operations. The, the company that um, we bought bee supplies from in Nebraska uh, was one of those aging companies and they were looking for someone to sell. So we talked about it and realized that here was an opportunity. Part of the training, part of the SAVE training farm will include an allied skills training center. So we'll train students there in metalworking and welding and basic mechanics and woodworking, skills you really need on a farm. We also wanted to be able to train them in business operations, how to build a business plan. And, uh, and, um, and so it just made sense to us that if we were to fold this into our beekeeping operation, that we could offer those things. I mean, here, here you see soldiers in here every day, sometimes one or two, sometimes a dozen, um, learning woodworking, but building things that we can then sell and use the proceeds back in the program to help us sustain it. Not to buy it as a business, but to buy it as a training platform. Yeah. You know, the average age of a farmer today is uh, 60, almost 60. In the state of Kansas, it's 74. 63% of all the farms in this country, regardless of size or type, are in the last generation. And so uh, there's a great need for new farmers, new and younger farmers. So step one to us was, let's get the program figured out, because we want to get soldiers into these programs as soon as we can, and not wait on infrastructure, if you will, to, because that takes longer. So currently, we have uh, 320 acres that we've identified and a, and a family has given us for lease. So that will be the start. And so our vision became a 500 plus acre farm um, um, with, all, with all types of farming on it that would um, train these young men and women up within a year's time and then place them on a farm, one of these 63% that are in the last generation farms, place them out there to help solve part of the succession problem in farming. Tomorrow we'll open that for the first time. We will toast our sign on the property and begin, uh, begin developing workshops on that actual farm and then farm it and build while we're farming. Just because life looks different now doesn't mean that you're damaged or that there's something wrong with you. It just means that things are different. And so the main tenant of what I help to bring and what the basis of this farm is, is all about growth and growth and new life and moving from a career that was based solely on dis destruction and war and coming back to something that is all about creation. It's about starting from that seed. It's about following through and watching new life happen. I'm currently stationed at, you know, Fort Rally. Kansas in the WTU getting medically retired out of the military because of PTSD. So this is my one way of giving back to fellow soldiers and veterans and doing what I love to do, and that's teach. I've gotten back that sense of uh, home, of a group of people that can relate to who I am, and I can relate to who they are. You know, you take someone like Tim, Tim Hyman, who I work in the, the wood shop with, and you put us together, it's an instant connection. For someone like me who's been in for 27 years, I really missed it. But now I feel like I'm, I'm back home, around the people I should be around. It's rewarding for me because it, it's occupying. It's a diversionary tactic. It helps me actually forget the trouble that I've gone, had or experienced. I'm a living proof that this program works, you know. So that's one of the biggest things that I want to be able to express to fellow veterans and take it to the next level.
Whenever you're in combat, it's a tough thing. And so I know what these men and women go through, what they're facing. These problems that they come back with aren't merely physical or mental. They're soul deep problems. And so we have an obligation as a country, I think, and uh, I've sort of obviously made it my own personal obligation to help them to get into farming, particularly with such great needs out there. It's a wonderful opportunity to address these needs. Why not? It's the right thing to do. Okay. Um, a part, of, part of it depended on what computer feed we had on. Part of that video was a little choppy to begin with. Uh, Sherry, when we post this thing on um, the YouTube on our YouTube channel, we'll be sure to include the original video. Uh, okay. And um, I think at the moment, um, you know, if you want us to rerun it at the end, we can try that. But uh, I'd much rather hear from you. So. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. And you know what? If you want to go to the Golden Prairie Honey Farms. Facebook page. I could probably share that this evening too, um, or send a link out to anybody who wants just to get the link in an email and watch it on their own as well. Yeah. Yeah, it's about four years old. I want to, and I guess when we start out with the next slide, I should say we already own that land. Um, so that we've come a long way. Okay, so we just watched the video, so you can go to the next slide. I don't know who's doing the next slide. Okay, so this has been a complete passion project and, and starting to, to see and watch people change and grow is about this um, really kind of sent me down the rabbit hole of research and we're really just at the precipice of, I've been published in American Bee Journal so far, but we have about four different research proposals and, and we're developing the theoretical model on the history of healing and beekeeping. And it goes back far. Um, and, and, and one of the most interesting things is reading the biography of Langstroth and how he had bipolar depression and how beekeeping actually saved his life um, and kept him from, from suicide. So it goes all the way back from goddess cults. And I love these Slav Slavic honey houses that you can go in and lay down in and it's just the reverberation and the smell and the sensory experience of being around bees that's healing. Um, and then during World War II uh, and World War I, when soldiers were coming back from, from war, they would put them in, in gardens and in apiaries to help facilitate their healing as well. Okay, next slide. So our program and the healing part of it is that we base it on the five tenets of post-traumatic growth. And we're finding that um, our program participants are finding a greater appreciation of life, improving relationships with others, developing personal strengths, um, having spiritual change. This is a really big thing in eco-psychology and that connection to something greater than yourself when you're taking care of bees and also new possibilities. Okay, next slide. Okay, so we are starting to pull out different fa psychological factors that are related to healing wounds and, uh, and, and not just combat related wounds, but other behavioral health diagnoses as well. And if you go to the next slide, I can talk about those. Okay, so the first First thing that we're finding, it's just behavioral activation. You're getting up, you're going outside, you're getting out of your chair, uh, you're maybe not drinking as much, um, but it, you're just getting up and going and doing something that has meaning and purpose. Um, also engaging in nature can be very, very healing. Um, caring about bees, anybody who works around bees and especially with like queen bees, like we really care a lot about them. Um, there's a social connection. You're working with other people. And if you ever want to talk to anybody about anything for about two hours, just ask a beekeeper to talk about bees, right? Um, and it's really interesting to see the camaraderie that comes in like-minded veterans. 1% um, of uh, our entire population serves in the, in the military. So they come back together as a team. And I think that that social 
um, connection is very important. And it's also one of the factors that is the number, it really helps in suicide prevention we're finding too. Okay, so the other one is distress tolerance. Anytime you have to go that very first time and open up a bee or if a beehive, or if you're going to take honey off, uh, it can be kind of unpleasant. And you have to learn how to regulate your emotions. If everybody starts fighting and there's an open beehive, the bees respond to that. Um, and we hear from a lot of our participants too, wow, if I could really not yell at somebody that I was upset about while we were doing beekeeping, then I can go home and I'm nicer to my family and my wife and my kids and, and I learn how to, to keep my calm and composure. So I think bees are also a fantastic societal model of communication and cooperation. And just having that very first job from when they're born of cleaning out their own cell to the very end of their life where they get to fly and come back and, and bring in honey. Um, I think that it's a, it's a nice, nice way to teach how to be a good communicator and how to get along with others. Um, community integration, again, we've got a lot of volunteers that come into the shop, certainly by selling honey and being at farmer's markets and interacting with other people. It's not just that you're going to go heal in that place for those people that have behavioral health disorders. Um, you get to, to integrate and, and transition. So emotional regulation is a big part of it. You gotta keep your cool. And I always say with bees, you guys know this, you gotta work fast, but you gotta work slow. You've got to keep um, that concentration going. You need to stay calm. Um, one of this first rule of safety is if you don't, don't swat, right? So if you can learn to not swat, maybe that can bleed over into other emotional situations. So mindfulness is one of my favorite things about beekeeping. Again, you have to work fast, but slow. You have to have a lot of concentration. Um, queen finding is one of my favorite things to do because you have to be very mindful and purposeful as you're working through those hives. Um, and then at the end of the day, you know, what's a better positive reinforcement or award, reward to be able to taste that honey or to be able to bottle that honey um, and to be able to eat the honey too and to see your, your bees being, um, being healthy too. Okay, next slide. So along with learning the beekeeping training, we are partnered with Consa Prairie Community Health Center and we also offer all of our participants, they don't have to come, it's not mandatory, but it's offered. So we use gold standard VA level evidence-based psychotherapy um, and we treat PTSD, we work on interpersonal issues. Um, I've been certified and gone through the Beck Institute to learn cognitive behavior therapy and cognitive processing therapy and on and on, but it's all evidence-based psychotherapy is also included um, in our program for anybody who wants it and it's free of charge. We uh, make sure that there's, we've removed every barrier of care. And so we have a lot of, uh, we have a, a lot of donations that come in to help pay for that. There's no use of insurance. You don't have to deal with forms. It's not going on your record somewhere. You just come in and you can have therapy. Okay, next slide. All right, so you got the testimonials at the video because all of our guys are at home because it's 9.20 at night here. So we can go to the next slide. Okay, so I guess that I'm just kind of ready for questions. I think I can let the moderator or I can open up the, the Q&A. Um, the information is on here uh, with our, um, our websites and also my, my personal email is on here. So if anybody wants to talk to me at length about any of the things that we're doing or, or want further information, um, you can just send me an email. So I think I'm, I, I like, I made good time. We might have some extra time. Oh, and here's my very fancy bibliography. I have about 27 more books that I'm, I'm looking and developing uh, research. And I, I really am gonna work on getting all that typed up so that that could be shareable. Um, there's some really, really interesting interesting books out there that address the issues of um, beekeeping and, and healing. Okay, well, 
We have an unusual situation where a speaker actually managed to, to cover the topics faster than, than, <laughs> <laughs> than the title. <laughs> uh, but let's open it up for questions, and this gives it a little bit more time for an interactive uh, discussion here. So, Ray, you want to lead off? So, Jerry, do you, do you, as far as questions go, are we looking at the, what is that called, Frank? The Q&A. The Q&A. Okay. Let's start there, and then if you've got some things. There was a couple remaining questions, but we didn't get to on the last segment. We could address and see if any sure. more filter in. And I, I imagine Gary's close by. He's sitting right here. If you, he can, he can scoot on in. We're, we got wheelie chairs. <laughs> One of the questions a, a bit ago was if you guys offer any type of distance learning uh, at this time with COVID and such. We do, we, we've done a couple virtual beak, beak boot camps, but we don't. But I would say that what I've done exclusively since COVID is all of the sessions for therapy have gone to telehealth. So I think it's one of the things that as we are um, kind of waiting to see where the world goes with COVID that we really want, we, we, if, we, if we're doing distance learning, what, what part of the healing part is that everybody's together. So I think that all of that, we've kind of tried to, I don't know. We haven't really decided about that. On the farm side, we've done. Uh, K State has a few few extension uh, training classes that fit in, and we've done the best we could to take those and fit them into our curriculum. But so much of what we do is hands on. I mean, so you can't go find a, a new calf in February out in the snow <laughs> very well and, and and really get the full effect of that. Or you can't teach welding. You can't teach those hard skills. So uh, we really haven't done much on the virtual side uh, during this period. Um, our student load has fallen off because of COVID, but, um, uh, but we still have sufficient to keep us going and, uh, and up and, up and uh, prosperous, yeah. Another person asked if there were any similar programs on the East Coast. I think, not that I know of. I think there's a lot of things popping up and, and our goal is to be able to roll out to the 78 land grant universities. And so, it, you know, it says, for example, if we, this program could be replicated and be in Florida and maybe people are working more on orange groves and blueberries or I don't know, things, or orchids or whatever they're doing in Florida. And, and then it, on the East Coast, they could specialize in the and whatever's going on there, maple syrup, I guess. In addition to uh, University of Montana, uh, Michigan has a program called Hives, Heroes to Hives, and um, they're, they're expanding. Um, there's a couple on the East Coast, I've forgotten what they're called, um, but there are a number of them around the country. I think, as far as I know, we're the only ones that have integrated the therapy program into, into our curriculum. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I should mention, if you if people want to switch over to the chat, there's several of the heroes groups and others that are following uh, this presentation tonight and have introduced themselves and so on. If you just uh, screen through those, you'll see several uh, and some questions about the logistics of programs like this. And I think Gary's a little bit far away from the uh, mic when he went on to talk a little bit about the question on online learning. Uh, we have been working with Gary since since we started our online learning program. As I said, he was one of our first uh, graduates. All of his students, all of his uh, B students, his soldiers take our courses. We hold slots open for them every time. We're, so in terms of online, the University of Montana, I think has the only university level program that teaches it as a discipline with three different levels and can be taken for academic credit. Um, and those, that program has exceeded anything that we would have ever imagined when we started in 2012. Uh, we have last, uh, this summer, some, or this last winter, I signed the 2000 certificate of completion uh, for at least one level. Uh, we have had students from every, every universe, from every state and every province in Canada and 20 other countries, that's the one that really surprises me, uh, take our courses. And the demand, some of these courses, they say, well, on, and we tried online and the demand's fallen off. So far, knock on wood, our demand hasn't fallen off at all. The quality of our students keep getting better. 
they push us even harder to up the game. The course, Gary, as your soldiers are probably telling you, that court, our courts have gotten a lot tougher than they were when you took them because we were still learning. But uh, uh, we are, te- there's five of us to teach these three level, there's an apprentice, journeyman, and a master level program. They're each eight, six to eight or nine weeks long. And we are, we are booked for 43 weeks of the year. Um, and we could do more if we had more capability, but unfortunately <laughs> it's only, only five of us at the moment, but, um, so, and, and then the planning that we're doing with, uh, Gary is including some more online opportunities, both through us. And I assume some will be coming through your end of the program too. I, I don't think that, I think that's likely for some of the things we might get into. So. Um, James Webb asks, can you talk more about the psychological research and what makes the difference and why does it work? Okay, so I think I had put the 10 tenets on there and I talked about the mindfulness. I guess if we could, I don't know if we can go back to that slide or make that um, there. And again, we're just at the point where we've, we're working with um, both Kansas State University and the University of Kansas Medical Center to develop the theoretical model. So um, just off the top of my head, we've got the five tenets of post-traumatic growth, um, which was developed by uh, Rick Calhoun and Larry Tedeschi in the University of North Carolina, um, that they're, we we're finding that that appreciation of life, relationships with others, new possibilities, spiritual change, and then relationships with others um, are very, very integral in what's going on with growth after trauma. Um, So yeah, I guess we just, it was the little seeds going there. So where I'm at is we've had the research proposals um, approved and we're, it's just me having the time to get together and write that. I am happy to collaborate with anybody. Um, I I, I guess the first research proposal is also including a biopsychosocial, just asking questions from veteran beekeepers. You know, how has this influenced your life in your physical self, in your emotional self, um, and then also in your social life. So any organizations that are working with veterans and bees, I can, uh, would love to pr- help send out those surveys, put that together and include you in the, the- in the theory development. Okay, so if you go to the next slide, I think, and then the next one. These, this is my theory and what, what I'll be proposing to do research in the theory, theoretical model. And once we get the qualitative data, that's the feedback and the anecdotal, um, what we're finding, what veterans are telling us when they're interacting with bees, um, then we can start doing qualitative data and get statistics um, based on these, um, these tenants right here. Yeah, so I did that answer your question. I can't see the chat room. I'm gonna go back to the Q&A here. They haven't typed a response, um, but we can move on to the next question, which relates is how do you measure outcomes from this work, which you kind of touched on there? Okay, so um, outcomes on measuring, number one, um, 75%, everybody who comes in that's getting therapy at least, they come in and they get a full psychological assessment. So they have a diagnosis. And then um, we also assess for suicidality and 75% of our participants have had some sort of suicidal ideation or active suicidal um, behaviors or intent. And every single one of them, it goes, it's gone down to a zero within about, sorry, my chair just went down, um, within, within about 16 weeks of therapy. So we use the Beck depression inventory and the Beck anxiety inventory, and also the PCL5, which is the post-traumatic checklist for PTSD. Um, And so we measure weekly and they actually have a chart and graph. So we've been starting to collect statistics on treatment outcomes um, for our participants who are attending therapy as well as, um, yeah. So that's kind of, I hope that answers that question. Uh, the next question is from Dale. Are you working directly with the Veterans Administration 
If so, what are your suggestions for beekeepers to work with VA hospitals and clinics on beekeeping programs? Right. So one of we we are we have um, we have a collaboration with the VA, and one of the things that when we first started working with them is they said, "Don't let your program get absorbed completely into the VA because they have another uh, lots of other things to do too." So um, my suggestion for that would be to get involved with the VRNE grants, vocation re rehabilitation and education. Um, and they have some grant uh, funding with that. And also um, the VA, uh, just get a hold of your local VA and go talk to people <laughs> because we've worked with mostly with the Topeka VA here. And then also because we are working with our state, our, sen our sen senators and politicians, they've all sort of helped us navigate that. And I got the nicest compliment from our VA person who's our advisor on our transition and wellness committee. And she came in and said, you are doing better than the VA. And that made me feel really good. And also because we're, re we're removing that barrier of care, someone comes into our program, they, the next week they're getting a diagnosis, they're understanding their symptoms. They have somebody who cares about them, who is working with them on these um, gold standard VA therapies to help them to get better. Um, the next question from Anthony, what issues of confidentiality of participants health history are there? I've been asked to help mentor vets in beekeeping, but they would not release much info. Okay, so we are, I, because we're partnered with Conza Prairie Community Health Center and I'm a psychologist, everything is HIPAA. Like we have complete HIPAA confidentiality. Um, when we do the statistics on treatment outcomes, no, no, we ask them first, they sign, would you be willing for data to be released about your treatment outcome and participate in research um, where th your identity is confidential? And mostly we get, you see on the videos, right? They wanna come and tell their story. There's, uh, I, I guess, because we've removed that barrier of insurance and worried about who's gonna see the documentations um, and they just can come to therapy with no strings attached. We really haven't had that issue um, we're, and, and of course, before I would disclose anybody's name or information, they, all the proper releases would be, would be signed, but mostly they want to talk about it. Yeah, what I've discovered as we're out uh, training them, they openly talk about it. They get in a group and all of a sudden the entire group is uh, bringing up their, it's almost like a, uh, a control group of, um, for therapy. Um, we're focusing on beekeeping, but they're sharing their stories and they're sharing their issues and after, after a short period of time, they're openly talking to me about uh, what they're trying to, to overcome. And so uh, it's just a matter of being available for them, being there for them. Yeah, and we also address stigma across the board for our entire organization. So I like to use the analogy, if you broke your arm and you're walking around with a broken arm for like six weeks, somebody might tell you, you need to go see somebody. And there would be no problem, right? Your arm's gonna stink, it might start hurting, you're gonna have a lot of issues. And it's the same thing with behavioral health. Like you were out there putting your life on the line for your country and you come back and you have these invisible wounds and it's the same kind of thing. If you, you know, you, you might need to go to a doctor or somebody who's can put your arm in a cast or do surgery if your arm's broken. Well, if you've got issues related to soul and deep emotional problems, it's also gonna leak out all over the place. And so then you can come in to see me and in a gentle process, be able to work through those things in an environment where it's confidential and it's, and you have someone that's going to help you walk through that journey and heal. At the same time, you're learning a trade and you're hanging out with other veterans and you get to do some fun things together and everybody gets to tell their bee sting stories. <laughs> And, and you've got meaning and purpose. And I just think we just find that they stop drinking so much. They're not suicidal anymore. They're getting off of their medications. And then they are just our friends. And we, call, we, we, we joke often that it's not really our family, but it's our family. And that we can get together and sit across a table or we, you know, whose honey tastes the best based on where it was placed or um, I don't know, we, we try our best just to have a lot of fun with it too and, 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 and heal and get a vocation and try to put everything all in one place. 
Okay, I'm going to, so I, I hope that answered that question. I hope I'm not getting too tangent, tangential. Uh, the next question is, although I, although I realize that you can't overly generalize, but what is the most difficult part of the beekeeping process that most military suffering with PS, PTSD are faced with? Okay, the most difficult part of the beekeeping. I'm trying to think about getting stung. Um, we, we had one example of, of just learning how to get your emotional regulation. So we had a guy, he got really angry and decided to kick over the beehive and take off his bee suit. You know, like, so what did you learn about that afterwards? That I don't know what the, the, the most difficult part that we have. I, since I work with them every day, I, I uh, think it's just getting them through that um, initial um, human fear of bees, I guess. And, and so it's just that that first couple of days, and it sometimes only takes a couple of hours, but sometimes a few days. And once they realize that it's it's not so so um, stingy and 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 so um, noisy. Yeah, yeah. I just once they get through that initial period, they're they're even more excited about the program. So otherwise, there really isn't much along the way. They just enjoy all of it, all, every aspect of it. Uh, it's just that initial, initial exposure that they need to get beyond. Um, Brian asked. Go ahead. I was going to say, like you, oh, go it's kind of a, a pride thing too, because if you're a veteran and you're going to war, you kind of have to be a badass. And then when you have to open up a beehive, you kind of have to be a badass too. So it's kind of bragging right <laughs> with it. <laughs> Um, Ryan says, I worked as a research assistant at the UM Apiary for my second summer and find myself being drawn more and more to beekeeping as a hobby and possibly as an income stream. What kind of job or entrepreneurial opportunities are available to a possibly aspiring beekeeper in Montana and the Northern Rockies region? How does the colder climate limit these opportunities? Okay, somebody else can answer that question. <laughs> I think the best thing for you would be to find a mentor somewhere nearby that can can uh, actually you can actually work with or can show you firsthand the different ways you can work in the bee business. And so uh, there's plenty of them in Montana, one of the top states. And so Gary probably has a list of folks that would be more than glad to serve as mentors for you. Well, well, Brian, Brian is one of my uh, uh, one of the research assistants we were introduced to bees last summer and is working for it this spring. Um, I, I read his uh, question just a little bit different. I think uh, I I told him about the meeting tonight, and and I think he's also asking might be asking a little bit more about how how your program might interact uh, with someone like himself. He's he's been working with me at the university. He's looking at your program wonders is essentially if that might be some type of transition. I'm, I'm guessing here, but. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, and so my answer to that would be is because we host the cons of beekeepers association, find your local beekeepers association. And then, th then everybody gets a bee buddy. Like you get assigned a mentor and then they, they take you through a whole season. Um, so well, I, think, I think one of the uh, strengths of our program also is the hands-on part. We spend far more time hands-on that we do uh, with, with Jerry's course or some of our internal courses that, that uh, complement uh, the University of Montana's course. So I think just getting out there and working uh, in a program like ours will, will uh, expose you to all the different aspects and the different markets and the different jobs that are available in the beekeeping, uh, beekeeping realm, honey production realm. I'm, I'm not sure that answers the question, but yeah. you know. uh, but, but there's uh, both on the chat and the question. There are a few questions, a few of these have been coming in. So I'm not sure that they've got like a clear read. If you, the person is a veteran and is interested in your program, how do they go about contacting you? Uh, they ask, do you have some type of pre screening? Uh, who's eligible? eligible? Right. So anybody, well, and we accept veterans and others too. So, and it's not just the veterans, it's their families too. So the wives can come through. It's everybody, the kids, we want this to be um, completely open to everyone. We do have an application. You can go to our website. It's online. Um, we have a few 
few things that we do, like if you're, if you're currently, if you need to go inpatient because you're that suicidal, we don't really have 24 hour care. Um, or if you have a substance use issue, um, driving tractors and working with bees doesn't really go with substance use. We ask that, um, that those are sort of, go take care of that at the VA first um, or privately and then come back and, um, and apply. But the application's on our website. So you can just go and, and look at it and you can see. Um, as, as far as who gets into our program, we do, someone can send me an email because that it's very complicated. We have a weighted kind of process for selection on, you know, do you already own land? Are you have coming, you have your own farm? Uh, are you, do you have combat related trauma? And, and some of those things actually work in your benefit to be selected into the program. Um, so I have a list of criteria. I just don't have it all right in front of me right now, but um, send me an email. I think that was Greg Shelley. And, I, and, and we're, I'll tell you, we're happy to share any information that anybody wants on, on doing anything similar. We're not kind of hiding away in our own little program here. We, we, we will disseminate as much information as you want. And also if anybody has any additional information that you feel might be helpful in the research that I'm doing or the work that we're doing, like please feel free to contact us and share it too. Um, I think we just wanna help as many people as possible and, and, and also get as many beekeepers out there as possible because we just love our bees and, and, our, and, and in general, <laughs> we want them to survive and be in good health. <laughs> Would it be helpful to skip forward in the slides back to the contact information slide in case anyone didn't catch sure. that? Sounds good. And then um, a couple last questions here. Um, do you involve clergy in treating veterans with moral injury? Um, I oh, actually, my I could talk about this for ten hours too. Um, my uh, my thesis was based on moral injury and post traumatic growth. Um, spiritual change is one of the tenets of, of post-traumatic growth, and it, we don't have this up and running yet, but we do kind of, um, there's two things that we have with clergy that, that are in the works. Number one is that we sort of have pastors from various um, different denominations, spiritual denominations, um, who would be available um, to come to the farm or to meet with people or even just come and go bowling with us, I don't know. Um, to just sort of integrate that into the process. Um, our orchard, we have 240 hazelnut trees that will be a veteran memorial orchard and it's a sensory garden. So it'll have dog tags for those we've lost. Um, and at the end of that, we plan to have some sort of non-denominational spiritual chapel um, meditation center. I don't know, we haven't really decided what to call it yet. And the other thing that we want is to put a prayer wall in that orchard. So as people are struggling with things, they can put their prayers into the wall, kind of like the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem. And then we'll collect those weekly and disseminate those out to the different churches. We have lots of churches in Manhattan, Kansas, and get those to the ladies in the prayer lists and, and have people pray for people. So that's, that's how we're planning on addressing the spiritual change. I hope that answers that question. But yes, we'd love clergy. That that's really mm -hmm. helpful. And and we're personally, you know, we're, we're very faith based. And look at our honey label, even too. I I don't know. We can read the quote. I don't. I have, don't have it memorized. Um, we don't force it on anybody. My chair. My foot is stuck in this chair. Um, but I'll let my dad read what we have on each one of our labels. We try to live by this too. I, 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 my glasses are pleasant words are a honeycomb. I can't read that. <laughs> my, I, my glass, I don't have my bifocals on. Sorry, he can read it. Pleasant words are, pleasant words are a honeycomb. <laughs> an old man We're all blind. Glasses. Well, we can get my husband's here. He can come over and read it. Read to the soul and healing to the body. Yep. Yeah. So, yeah, and I think uh, I think you will find also that moral injury, just like other forms of uh, of invisible wounds, can be treated with traditional methods, also of uh, psychological help. Mm -hmm. And 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 it really we we address that. It's PTSD isn't just about the fact that you were afraid of everything that happened over there. It's also that you have to come back and get integrated into a society 
that, you know, the things that you do for your job when you're in combat may not be things that you can sit around and talk about with, but you will need to process that and a lot of forgiveness. Um, and there's very, a lot of evidence-based um, cognitive processing therapy is really good for that. And there's manuals that are out there exclusively that address the, the, the morally injurious things that have happened to people. And knowing that you can come to a therapist in a safe space where you can talk about those horrific things and you've got somebody to navigate through that so that you can make sense of all of it really can be life-changing. Um, and, and you have that, that you can, someone that can hold that space for you and walk through that with you. And I do that every day. And it's just such an honor to be able to help people um, to move past those types of injuries. Um, I don't know. It's one of my favorite things to work on. Um, Anthony adds, this is a great program. What models of similar programs for vets in agriculture have you used to develop your current program? Uh, we just get, made it up <laughs> on our own. There was, well, there was, I don't know. I mean, we've got well, a we lot used, of help. We used uh, some of the vocational schools. The one area community college uh, helped us a great deal. Uh, a few of the other community colleges also. So we brought those programs together and considered them. Uh, we brought um, a lot of extension agents in. We talked to farmers and asked them what they wanted and what they needed, different types of farmers. But uh, we didn't have a cookie cutter out there to use. And it was uh, the, initial, the initial curriculum development was the work of a committee over a long period of time. And it's and still changes. It changes um, constantly to bring in the new methods and new equipment and new thought, new ideas. So it's, it's rather unique, I think. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Um, another question from the same gentleman. If a vet with a small farm wants to take up beekeeping to help supplement his or her income, is the program basically the same for them as for the commercial program? Oh, we can do any level. Like if somebody yes. just, and yes. we, we kind of say from the beginning, if you want to come in and you want to be a backyard beekeeper, just get two hives, not just one. Yeah, you, don't, you don't really need to go through the commercial course uh, to do that. I think if you get through the, um, actually if you get through the first couple of levels of the University of Montana course with some on-hands mentorship, on, uh, hands-on mentorship, uh, you'd be well enough off to, to, to be able to keep some hives in your backyard to supplement your income. And that's what we have some with 50, some with 40, some with 10. And uh, of course, they don't have any problem selling their honey. It's in such demand. Well, not just the honey, but the wax. I think the wax is almost more valuable than the honey. Are no, the same. So, so, um, so you don't really need to be a, go through a commercial course in order to keep bees as a supplement. Not by any means. No, and you can also, again, find your local beekeeping association. They tend to meet about once a month and then they can assign you to a bee buddy too, um, to just take you through that first year. Yeah, if they have one in your area. But and so many of them are meeting on Zoom now. You probably could jump in on, on our kinds of beekeeping association. <laughs> they, they, a lot of them are offering Zoom meetings too. That's about it for the questions, I think. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I agree. I think uh, we, we've had an, an, uh, an uncommonly good uh, set of questions and answers, responses. Uh, and I think this topic really lends itself well to kind of a dynamic interaction. And so I really appreciate both of you being here presenting today. And um, Ray and, and Frank for tag taming each other and the questions and answers and so on. If uh, under the chat, the one thing that might have fallen out is there are several different groups that have self-identified as working with uh, various mentoring programs for soldiers uh, and they're listing themselves under the chat thing. So if anyone is interested in other opportunities, you go look at the chat and you'll find some things. And uh, Gary and, and Sherry, if you'd like, I can leave when we officially finish tonight in just a couple minutes here, uh, I can leave this up for a little bit. So if you two wanted to have a little time to look at the chat and questions and, and see if there's anything we missed that you want to respond to, that, that's fine with me. Or or if you think we've done it, uh, you know, pretty well covered it, then that's fine too. So 
Well, and, and I think I'll say, because it's getting to be almost 10 o'clock here, that if we didn't cover, if I didn't answer your question, or if you had further questions, just go ahead and shoot us an email. Okay. And we've got the slides up. Yeah, we got the slides up for the question. So that's great. Uh, so I think it's been a great evening. Uh, I think that although we didn't have quite a, a larger group as we have for some of our more B-related issues, I think this is a really important thing to, to highlight and to get the word out. And what I see is that we had a lot of representatives of other associations working with with uh, people like you are, with soldiers and so on, that are listening. And I'm sure they're the ears and eyes for their groups and so on. So I, I think I think from that standpoint is it you know we've got other groups following this one more than you know that that are vested interest in this. And so this is a kind of a niche uh, specialty, but I I think it's a really critical and important one. And I take my hat off to both of you and commend you for what you're doing. And, and Gary, um, thank God you didn't retire. <laughs> the, um, so next, on May 19th, we'll have our next mini conference. And the speakers actually will kind of uh, continue in this vein, not so much with soldiers, but society and hobby beekeepers and how they get into beekeeping, and particularly women in beekeeping. And so Tammy Horn Potter, Dr. Potter, is the Kentucky apiarist, and she's a has an author, is author uh, has written several books about people, particularly women engaged in beekeeping. Has a new book coming out, uh, and Eleanor Snow Andrews, who is at Cornell University, and did thesis work on what motivates uh, hobby beekeepers, and she's going to be talking about the socio sociological uh, aspects of uh, beekeeping and sustainable beekeeping. So. In a sense, this week, this month, the next month, are kind of turning it around instead of looking at the bees, looking back at the beekeeper, uh, and so that's kind of the thread that we've got going here. Um, the month after that, we'll turn back in June. We're going to go back to uh, more of a bee-centric uh, talk. We have two really knowledgeable experts from New Zealand. One talking about this whole manuka honey and labeling and branding the honeys and so on. And the other one who is a superb uh, expert in marketing honey, some of the best I've seen anywhere in the world. She's uh, uh, involved with Coloss and uh, honey re research and honey marketing and so on. So, so next month will be bee history and beekeeping and history and, uh, and sustainable beekeeping and kind of looking at it from the who gets into beekeeping and why and what the implication of all that is. That's May, June. We'll be uh, we'll be uh, special looking specifically at uh, the news. I got my schedule right here. The New Zealand uh, honey market and what lessons that might be learned that are applicable. Um, Ray, you can get your kids uh, that are doing their own boutique uh, honey products and stuff. They they'll probably be interested in that one. Uh, I thought of them almost immediately. Um, I met this one individual a few years ago, and she just blew me away. I mean, she's really creative about how she's approached this. So I think we had a great evening here. I thank everybody that's participated. Um, have a good weekend. Ours are looking balmy and sunny. We're really glad to see this, and I'm hoping all yours are too. Thanks to Chris for helping us out, and Frank for, for helping out uh, Ray there. And You know, you, Chris and Frank make Ray and me look good, so... <laughs> Thank you very much for having us. And Ray, I just put 80 of your queens out today, and we'll probably put out more than that tomorrow if it doesn't rain. Nice. <laughs> so, nice. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. All right. Thank thanks, you. everybody. Thanks, Ray. Thanks, thanks Jerry. Thanks, thanks, Gary. Frank. Take you can go guys. have your dinner now. <laughs> you want to leave it up and, and see if there's any questions we can answer? No. Okay, Chris. Yeah, I'm here. <clears throat> all right, so you got that all recorded, right? Uh, yeah, I'll stop the recording now. Uh, and I will send it on to Jaylene. I think she's gonna put it on YouTube. All that, yeah. Yep. Yeah, I don't know what happened to me tonight. I, I had my my record set to auto after the uh, text thing that's on. I looked down when they had this question about we get the PowerPoint to suddenly realize that for some reason, for the first time in months, my auto record didn't work. <laughs> oh, no. Well, I, yeah, I, uh,
I'm hoping that the very beginning didn't get cut off. I'll have to check that because it's supposed to save it to the cloud. Uh, mm -hmm. But I'm not sure. I'm not sure how that works because I I didn't get my per because I'm recording on my other computer here. Okay. Because uh, I I know Jaylene was talking about they had really limited space on the cloud. Yeah, I we learned that's one of the reasons why I usually try to run a backup. I always run mine straight to the computer. Yeah, same. Um, but I'm I'm hope because I I didn't. I forgot too. So I, I'm hoping that the cloud one caught the beginning. Okay. Uh, the first couple of minutes of the, the first presentation. Um, All right. Uh, well, we'll have to, you know, hopefully if it was the video that got clipped, <laughs> you could just add that back in or Jaylene can cut it in. That's true. Yeah. Uh, yeah we'll, I, just, we'll find I, out. You know, I don't know what happened to my record here because. Uh, you know, I laugh at myself because even I had a short meeting this morning to record it and so on. And I didn't do anything to my settings. So week after week, I had to go through and clear out the things that I recorded. But I figured, well, it's better to have to throw it away than the other. And then I've been to this thing and said, shit, it didn't record. <laughs> <laughs> right. So.